This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Young Visitors, or Mr. Saltina's Plan By Daisy Ashford, age nine With a preface by J. M. Barry The Young Visitors, or Mr. Saltina's Plan Preface The owner of the copyright guarantees that The Young Visitors is the unaided effort in fiction of an authoress of nine years. Effort, however, is an absurd word to use, as you may see by studying the triumphant countenance of the child herself, which is here reproduced as frontispiece to her sublime work. This is no portrait of a writer who had to burn the oil at midnight. Indeed, there is documentary evidence that she was hauled off to bed every evening at six. It has an air of careless power. There is a complacency about it that by the severe might perhaps be called smugness. It needed no effort for that face to knock off a masterpiece. It probably represents precisely how she looked when she finished a chapter. When she was actually at work, I think the expression was more solemn, with the tongue firmly clenched between the teeth, an unholy rapture showing as she drew near her love chapter. Fellow craftsmen will see that she is looking forward to this chapter all the time. The manuscript is in pencil in a stout little notebook, tuppence, and there it has lain for years, for though the authoress was nine when she wrote it, she is now a grown woman. It has lain in lavender, as it were, in the dumpy notebook, waiting for a publisher to ride that way and rescue it. And here it is at last, not a bit afraid that to this age it may appear Victorian. Indeed, if its pictures of high life are accurate, as we cannot doubt the authoress seems always so sure of her facts, they had a good way of going on in those times, which is really surprising. Even the grand historical figures were free and easy, such as King Edward, of whom we have perhaps the most human picture ever penned, as he appears at a levee rather sumptuously in a small but costly crown, and afterwards slips away to tuck into ices. It would seem in particular that we are oddly wrong in our idea of the young Victorian lady as a person more shy and shrinking than the girl of today. The Ethel of this story is a fascinating creature, who would have a good time wherever there were a few males, but no longer could she voyage through life quite so jollily without attracting the attention of the censorious. Chaperone seems to be one of the very few good words of which our authoress had never heard. The lady she had grown into, the owner of the copyright already referred to, gives me a few particulars of this child she used to be and is evidently a little scared of her. We should all probably be a little scared, though proud, if that portrait was dumped down in front of us as ours, and we were asked to explain why we once thought so much of ourselves as that. Except for the smirk on her face, all I can learn of her now is that she was one of a small family who lived in the country, invented their own games, dodged the governess, and let the rest of the world go hang. She read everything that came her way, including, as the context amply proves, the grown-up novels of the period. I adored writing and used to pray for bad weather, so that I need not go out but could stay in and write. Her mother used to have early tea in bed, sometimes visitors came to the house, when there was talk of events in high society. There was mention of places called Hampton Court, the Gaiety Theatre, and the Crystal Palace. This is almost all that is now remembered, but it was enough for the blazing child. She sucked her thumb for a moment, this is guesswork, and sat down to her amazing tale. Her mother used to have early tea in bed. Many authors must have had a similar experience, but they all missed the possibilities of it until this young woman came along. It thrilled her, and tea in bed at last takes its proper place in fiction. Mr. Saltina woke up rather early next day and was delighted to find Horace the footman entering with a cup of tea. Oh, thank you, my man, said Mr. Saltina, rolling over in the costly bed. Mr. Clark is nearly out of the bath, sir, announced Horace. I will have great pleasure in turning it on for you, if such is your desire. Well, yes, you might, said Mr. Saltina, seeing it was the idea. Mr. Saltina cleverly conceals his emotion, but as soon as he is alone he rushes to Ethel's door. 
I say, said Mr. Saltina excitedly, I have had some tea in bed. Sometimes visitors came to the house. Nothing much in that to us, but how consummately this child must have studied them, if you consider what she knew of them before the vehicle arrived to take them back to the station, you will never dare spend another weekend in a house where there may be a novelist of nine years. I am sure that when you left your bedroom this child stole in, examined everything, and summed you up. She was particularly curious about the articles on your dressing table, including the little box containing a reddish powder, and she never desisted from watching you till she caught you dabbing it on your cheeks. This powder, which she spells R-U-G-E, rouge, went a little to her head, and it accompanies Ethel on her travels with superb effects. For instance, she is careful to put it on to be proposed to, and again its first appearance is excused in words that should henceforth be serviceable in every boudoir. I shall put some red rouge on my face, said Ethel, because I am very pale owing to the drains in this house. Those who read will see how the rooms in Hampton Court became the compartments in the Crystal Palace, and how the Gaiety Hotel grew out of the Gaiety Theatre, with many other agreeable changes. The novelist will find the tale a model for his future work. How incomparable, for instance, the authoress dives into her story at once. How cunningly throughout she keeps us on the hooks of suspense, jumping to Mr. Saltina when we are in a quiver about Ethel, and turning to Ethel when we are quite uneasy about Mr. Saltina. This authoress of nine is flirting with her readers all the time. Her mind is such a rich pocket that as she digs in it, her head to the side and her tongue well out, she sends up showers of nuggets. There seldom probably was a novelist with such an uncanny knowledge of his characters as she has of Mr. Saltina. The first line of the tale etches him for all time. Mr. Saltina was an elderly man of forty-two, and fond of asking people to stay with him. On the next page, Saltina draws a touching picture of himself in a letter accepting an invitation. I do hope I shall enjoy myself with you. I am fond of digging in the garden, and I am partial to ladies, if they are nice. I suppose it is my nature. I am not quite a gentleman, but you would hardly notice it. Uh, but it can't be helped anyhow. When the great morning arrived, Mr. Saltina did not have an egg for his breakfast in case he should be sick on the journey. For my part, I love Mr. Saltina, who has a touch of Hamlet, and I wished up to the end that Ethel would make him happy, though I never had much hope after I read the description of Bernard Clark's legs. It is not to be wondered at that Mr. Saltina soon grew rather jealous of Bernard, who showed off from the first. "'My own room is next to the bathroom,' said Bernard. "'It is decorated dark red, as I have somber tastes. The bathroom has got a tip basin.' Thus was Mr. Saltina put in his place, and there the cruel authoress, with her tongue farther out than ever, doggedly keeps him. After dinner, Ethel played some merry tunes on the piano, and Bernard responded with a rather loud song in a bass voice, and Ethel clapped him a good deal. Then Mr. Saltina asked a few riddles, as he was not musical. No wonder Mr. Saltina went gloomily to bed, not to sleep, but to think out the greater riddle of how to become a gentleman, with which triumphant adventure the book is largely concerned. To many the most instructive part of the story will be the chapter entitled Bernard's idea. Bernard's idea, warmly acclaimed by Ethel, is that she and he should go up to London for a few weeks' gaiety. Something of the kind has often been done in fiction and in guidebooks, but never probably in such a hearty way as here. Arrived at the Gaiety Hotel, Bernard pokes his head into the window of the pay desk. Have you a couple of bedrooms for self and young lady? he inquired in a lordly way. He is told that they have two beauties. "'Thank you,' said Bernard. "'We will go up, if you have no objection.' "'None whatever, sir,' said the genial lady. "'The beds are well aired, and the view quite pleasant.' "'Come along, Ethel,' cried Bernard. "'This sounds all right, eh?' "'Oh, quite,' said Ethel, with a beaming smile. "'He decides gallantly that the larger room shall be hers. "'I shall be quite lost in that large bed,' Ethel said. "'Yes, I expect you will,' said Bernard. "'And now how about a little table d'hote followed by a theatre? Bernard's proposal should be carried in the pocket of all future swains. He decides, whilst imbibing his morning tea beneath the pink silken quilt, that to propose in London would not be the correct idea. He springs out of bed and knocks at Ethel's door. 
are you up my dear he called well not quite said ethel hastily jumping from her downy nest he explains his idea oh hurrah shouted ethel i shall soon be ready as i had my bath last night so won't wash very much now they go up the river in a boat and after they had eaten and drunk deeply of the charming viands ending up with meringues and chocolates bernard says in a passionate voice let us now bask under the spreading trees oh yes let's said ethel ethel he murmured in a trembly voice oh what is it said ethel what it was as well she knew was love eternal ethel accepts him faints and is brought back to life by a clever idea of bernard's who pours water on her she soon came to and looked up with a sickly smile take me back to the gaiety hotel she whispered faintly with pleasure my darling said bernard i will just pack up our viands ere i unloose the boat ethel felt better after a few drops of champagne and began to tidy her hair while bernard packed the remains of the food then arm in arm they tottered to the boat i trust you have not got an illness my darling murmured bernard as he helped her in oh no i am very strong said ethel i fainted from joy she added to explain matters oh i see said bernard handing her a cushion well some people do he added kindly so i will end my chapter the authoress says and we can picture her doing it complacently and slowly pulling in her tongue ethel was married in the abbey her wedding dress was a rich satin with a humped pattern of gold on the pure white and it had a long train edged with arum lilies you will indeed be a charming spectacle my darling gasped bernard as they left the shop and i have no doubt she was she got many delightful presents the nicest of all being from her father who provided a check for two pounds and promised to send her a darling little baby calf when ready this is perhaps the prettiest touch in the story and should make us all take off our hats to the innocent wondering mind that thought of it poor mr saltina he was at the wedding dressed in black and crying into his handkerchief however he recovered to an extent and married another and had ten children five of each none of them of course equal to ethel's children of whom in a remarkably short time there were seven which the authoress evidently considers to be the right idea it seems to me to be a remarkable work for a child remarkable even in its length and completeness for when children turn author they usually stop in the middle like the kitten when it jumps the penciled manuscript has been accurately reproduced not a word added or cut out each chapter being in one long paragraph however uh, this has been subdivided for the readers comfort j m barry end of preface part 1 of the young visitors or mr saltina's plan this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 Quite a Young Girl Mr. Saltina was an elderly man of forty-two, and was fond of asking people to stay with him. He had quite a young girl staying with him of seventeen, named Ethel Montague. Mr. Saltina had dark, short hair and mustache and whiskers, which were very black and twisty. He was middle-sized, and he had very pale blue eyes. He had a pale brown suit, but on Sundays he had a black one, and he had a topper every day as he thought it more becoming. Ethel Montague had fair hair, done on the top, and blue eyes she had a blue velvet frock which had grown rather short in the sleeves she had a black straw hat and kid gloves one morning mr saltina came down to breakfast and found ethel had come down first which was strange is the tea made ethel he said rubbing his hands yes said ethel and such a queer shaped parcel has come for you yes indeed it was a queer shaped parcel it was a hat box tied down very tight 
and a letter stuffed between the string. Well, well, said Mr. Saltina, parcels do turn queer. I will read the letter first, and so saying he tore open the letter, and this is what it said. My dear Alfred, I want you to come for a stop with me, so I have sent you a top hat, wrapped up in tissue paper, inside the box. Will you wear it staying with me, because it is very uncommon? Please bring one of your young ladies, whichever is the prettiest in the face. I remain yours truly, Bernard Clark. Well, said Mr. Saltina, I shall take you to stay, Ethel, and fancy him sending me a top hat. Then Mr. S. opened the box, and there lay the most splendid top hat of a lovely rich tone, rather like grapes, with a ribbon round complete. Well, said Mr. Saltina peevishly, I don't know if I shall like it. The bow of the ribbon is too flighty for my age. Then he sat down and ate the egg which Ethel had so kindly laid for him. After he had finished his meal, he got down and began to write to Bernard Clark. He ran upstairs on his fat legs and took out his blotter with a loud sniff, and this is what he wrote. My dear Bernard, certainly I shall come and stay with you next Monday. I will bring Ethel Montague, commonly called Miss M., she is very active and pretty. I do hope I shall enjoy myself with you. I am fond of digging in the garden, and I am partial to ladies, if they are nice. I suppose it is my nature. I am not quite a gentleman, but you would hardly notice it, but can't be helped anyhow. We will come by the 315. Your old and valued friend, Alfred Saltina. Perhaps my readers will be wondering why Bernard Clark had asked Mr. Saltina to stay with him. He was a lonely man in a remote spot, and he liked people and parties, but he did not know many. What rot, muttered Bernard Clark, as he read Mr. Saltina's letter. He was rather a presumptuous man. End of chapter. Chapter 2. Starting Gaily. When the great morning came, Mr. Saltina did not have an egg for his breakfast, in case he should be sick on the journey. "'What top hat will you wear?' asked Ethel. "'I shall wear my best black and my white alpaca coat to keep off the dust and flies,' replied Mr. Saltina. "'I shall put some red rouge on my face,' said Ethel, "'because I am very pale owing to the drains in this house.' You will look very silly, said Mr. Saltina, with a dry laugh. Well, so will you, said Ethel, in a snappy tone, and she ran out of the room with a very superior run, throwing out her legs behind, and her arms swinging in rhythm. Well, said the owner of the house, she has a most idiotic run. Presently, Ethel came back in her best hat and a lovely velvet coat of royal blue. Do I look nice in my get-up? she asked. Mr. Saltina surveyed her. You look rather rash, my dear. Your colors don't quite match your face. But never mind. I am just going up to say good-bye to Rosaline, the housemaid. Well, don't be long, said Ethel. Mr. S. skipped upstairs to Rosaline's room. Good-bye, Rosaline, he said. I shall be back soon, and I hope I shall enjoy myself. I make no doubt of that, sir, said Rosaline with a blush, as Mr. Saltina silently put two and six on the dirty toilet cover. Take care of your bronchitis, said Mr. S. rather bashfully, and he hastily left the room, waving his hand carelessly to the housemaid. Come along, cried Ethel, powdering her nose in the hall. Let us get into the cab. Mr. Saltina did not care for powder, but he was an unselfish man, so he dashed into the cab. Sit down, said Ethel, as the cabman waved his whip. You are standing on my luggage. Well, I am paying for the cab, said Mr. S., so I might be allowed to put my feet where I like. They travelled second class in the train, and Ethel was longing to go first, but thought perhaps least said, soonest mended. Mr. Saltina got very excited in the train about his visit. Ethel was calm, but she felt excited inside. 
Bernard has a big house, said Mr. S., gazing at Ethel. He is inclined to be rich. Oh, indeed, said Ethel, looking at some cows flashing past the window. Mr. S. felt rather disheartened, so he read the paper till the train stopped, and the porters shouted, Rickamere Station! We had better collect our traps, said Mr. Saltina, and just then a very exalted footman, in a cocked hat and olive-green uniform, put his head in at the window. Are you for Rickamere Hall? he said in impressive tones. Well, yes, I am, said Mr. Saltina, and so is this lady. Very good, sir, said the noble footman. If you will alight, I will see to your luggage. There is a conveyance awaiting you. Oh, thank you, thank you, said Mr. S., and he and Ethel stepped along the platform. Outside they found a lovely carriage, lined with olive-green cushions to match the footman, and the horses had green bridles and bows in their manes and tails. They got gingerly in. Will he bring our luggage? asked Ethel nervously. I expect so, said Mr. Saltina, lighting a very long cigar. Do we tip him? asked Ethel quietly. Well, no, I don't think so, not yet. We had better just thank him politely. Just then the footman staggered out with the baggage. Ethel bowed gracefully over the door of the carriage, and Mr. S. waved his hand as each bit of luggage was hoisted up to make sure it was all there. Then he said, Thank you, my good fellow, very politely. Not at all, sir, said the footman, and touched his cocked hat. He jumped actively to the box. I was right not to tip him, whispered Mr. Saltina. The thing to do is to leave two and six on your dressing table when your stay is over. Does he find it? asked Ethel, who did not really know at all how to go on a visit. I believe so, replied Mr. Saltina. Anyway, it is quite the custom, and we can't help it if he does not. Now, my dear, what do you think of the scenery? Very nice, said Ethel, gazing at the rich fur rug on her knees. Just then the carriage rolled into a beautiful drive with tall trees and big red flowers growing amid shiny dark leaves. Presently the haughty coachman pulled up with a great clatter at a huge front door with tall pillars each side of a big iron bell and two very clean scrapers. The doors flung open as if by magic causing Ethel to jump, and a portly butler appeared on the scene with a very shiny shirt and a huge pale face. "'Welcome, sir!' he exclaimed good-naturedly, as Mr. Saltina alighted rather quickly from the vehicle, "'and please to step inside!' Mr. Saltina stepped in as bid, followed by Ethel. The footman again struggled with the luggage, and the butler, Francis Minnett by name, kindly lent a hand. The hall was very big and hung round with guns and mate and ancestors, giving it a gloomy but a grand air. The butler then showed them down a winding corridor, till he came to a door which he flung open, shouting, Mr. Saltina and a lady, sir. A tall man of twenty-nine rose from the sofa. He was rather bent in the middle, with very nice long legs, fairish hair, and blue eyes. "'Hullo, Alf, old boy!' he cried. "'So you have got here all safe and no limbs broken.' "'None, thank you, Bernard,' replied Mr. Saltina, shaking hands. "'And let me introduce Miss Montague. She is very pleased to come for this visit.' "'Oh, yes,' gasped Ethel, blushing through her red rouge. Bernard looked at her keenly and turned a dark red. "'I am glad to see you,' he said. "'I hope you will enjoy it, but I have not arranged any parties yet, as I don't know anybody.' "'Don't worry,' murmured Ethel. "'I don't mix much in society.' And she gave him a dainty smile. "'I expect you would like some tea,' said Bernard. "'I will ring.' Yes, indeed, we should, said Mr. Saltina, eagerly. Bernard pealed the bell, and the butler came in with a stately walk. 
tea please minnit cried bernard clark with pleasure sir replied minnit with a deep bow a glorious tea then came in on a gold tray two kinds of bread and butter a lovely jam roll and lovely sugar cakes ethel's eyes began to sparkle and she made several remarks during the meal i expect you would now like to unpack said bernard when it was over well yes that is rather an idea said mr saltina i have given the best spare room to miss montague said bernard with a gallant bow and yours turning to mr saltina opens out of it so you will be nice and friendly uh, both the rooms have big windows and a handsome view how charming said ethel yes well let us go up replied bernard and he led the way up many a winding stairway till they came to an oak door with some lovely swans and bulrushes painted on it here we are he cried gaily ethel's room was indeed a handsome compartment with purple silk curtains and a four-post bed draped with the same shade the toilet set was white with mauve and there were some violets in a costly vase oh i say cried ethel in surprise i am glad you like it said bernard and here we have yours alf he opened the dividing doors and portrayed a smaller but dainty room all in pale yellow and wild primroses my own room is next the bathroom said bernard it is decorated dark red as i have somber tastes the bathroom has got a tip-up basin and a hose thing for washing your head a good notion said mr saltina who was secretly getting jealous here we will leave our friends to unpack and end this chapter end of chapter chapter three the first evening when they had unpacked mr saltina and ethel went downstairs to dinner mr saltina had put on a complete evening suit as he thought it was the correct idea and some ruby studs he had got at a sale ethel had on a dress of yellow silk covered with tulle which was quite in the fashion and she had on a necklace which mr saltina gave her for a birthday present she looked very becoming and pretty and bernard heaved a sigh as he gave her his arm to go into dinner the butler minute was quite ready for the fray standing up and very stiff and surrounded by two footmen in green plush and curly white wigs who were called charles and horace well said mr saltina lapping up his turtle soup you have a very sumptuous house bernard his friend gave a weary smile and swallowed a few drops of sherry wine it is fairly decent he replied with a bashful glance at ethel after our repast i will show you over the premises many thanks said mr saltina getting rather flustered with his forks you ought to give a ball remarked ethel you have such large compartments yes there is room enough sighed bernard we might try a few steps and meanwhile i might get to know a few people so you might responded ethel giving him a speaking look mr saltina was growing a little peevish but he cheered up when the port wine came on the table and the butler put round some costly finger bowls he did not have any in his own house and he followed bernard clark's advice as to what to do with them after dinner ethel played some merry tunes on the piano and bernard responded with a rather loud song in a bass voice and ethel clapped him a good deal then mr saltina asked a few riddles as he was not musical then bernard said shall i show you over my domain and they strolled into the gloomy hall I see you have a lot of ancestors, said Mr. Saltina in a jealous tone. Who are they? Well, said Bernard, they are all quite correct. This is my Aunt Caroline. She was rather eccentric and quite old. 
so I see said Mr Salteena and he passed on to a lady with a very tight waist and queerly shaped that is Mary Ann Fudge my grandmother I think said Bernard she was very well known in her day why asked Ethel who was rather curious by nature well I don't quite know said Bernard but she was and he moved away to the next picture it was of a man with a fat smiley face and a red ribbon round him and a lot of medals my great uncle Ambrose Fudge said Bernard carelessly he looks a thorough ancestor said Ethel kindly well he was said Bernard in a proud tone he was really the sinister son of Queen Victoria not really cried Ethel in excited tones but what does that mean well I don't quite know said Bernard Clark it puzzles me very much but ancestors do turn queer at times perhaps it means godson said mr saltina in an intelligent voice well i don't think so said bernard but i mean to find out it is very grand anyhow said ethel it is that replied her host genially who is this said mr saltina halting at a picture of a lady holding up some grapes and smiling a good deal her name was called Minnie Pilato, responded Bernard. She was rather far back, but a real relation, and she was engaged to the Earl of Tullyvarden, only it did not quite come off. What a pity, cried Ethel. Yes, it was, rather, replied Bernard, but she married a captain in the Navy and had seven children, so she was quite all right. Here Mr. Saltina thought he had better go to bed as he had had a long journey bernard always had a few prayers in the hall and some whiskey afterwards as he was rather pious but mr saltina was not very addicted to prayers so he marched up to bed ethel stayed as she thought it would be a good thing the butler came in as he was a very holy man and bernard piously said the our father and a very good hymn called i will keep my anger down and a decade of the rosary ethel chimed in quietly and francis minnit was most devout and ethel thought what a good holy family she was stopping with so i will end my chapter end of chapter chapter 4 mr saltina's plan Mr. Saltina woke up rather early next day and was surprised and delighted to find Horace the footman entering with a cup of tea. Oh, thank you, my man, said Mr. Saltina, rolling over in the costly bed. Mr. Clark is nearly out of the bath, sir, announced Horace. I will have great pleasure in turning it on for you, if such is your desire. Well, yes, you might, said Mr. Saltina, seeing it was the idea, and Horace gave a profound bow. Ethel, are you getting up? shouted Mr. Saltina. Very nearly, replied Ethel faintly from the next room. I say, said Mr. Saltina excitedly, I have had some tea in bed. So have I, replied Ethel. Then Mr. Saltina got into a mauve dressing gown with yellow tassels, and seizing his soap, he wandered off to the bathroom, which was most sumptuous. It had a lovely white shiny bath and sparkling taps and several towels arrayed in readiness by thoughtful Horace. It also had a step for climbing up into the bath and other good dodges of a rich nature. Mr. Saltina washed himself well and felt very much better. After breakfast Mr. Saltina asked Bernard if he could have some private conversation with him. Well, yes, replied Bernard. If you will come into my study we can have a few words. Can't I come too? muttered Ethel sulkily. No, my dear, said Mr. Saltina, this is private. Perhaps later I might have a private chat with you, Miss Montague, said Bernard kindly. Oh, let's do, said Ethel. Then Bernard and Mr. S. strolled into the study and sat upon two armchairs. Fire away, said Bernard, lighting his pipe. Well, I can't.
can't exactly do that said Mr Salteena in slow tones it is a serious matter and you can advise me as you are a thorough gentleman I am sure well yes said Bernard what can I do for you eh Alf you can help me perhaps to be more like a gentleman said Mr Salteena getting rather hot I am quite all right as they say but I would like to be the real thing can it be done he added slapping his knees I don't quite know said Bernard it might take a good time might it said Mr. S but I would slave for years if need be Bernard scratched his head why don't you try the Crystal Palace he asked several people earls and even dukes have private compartments there but I am not an earl said Mr. Saltina in a perplexed tone true replied Bernard but I understand that there are sort of students there who want to get into the war office and notable banks would that be a help asked Mr. Saltina eagerly well it might said Bernard I can give you a letter to my old pal the Earl of Clincham who lives there he might rub you up and by mixing with him you would probably grow more seemly oh ten thousand thanks said Mr. Saltina I will go there as soon as it can be arranged if you would be so kind as to keep an eye on Ethel while I'm away oh yes said Bernard I may be running up to town for a few days and she could come too you are too kind said Mr. Saltina and I don't think you will find her any trouble no I don't think I shall said Bernard she is a pretty girl cheerful and active and he blushed rather red end of chapter chapter five the crystal palace about nine o'clock next morning mr saltina stood bag in hand in the ancestral hall waiting for the vehicle to convey him to the station bernard clark and ethel were seated side by side on a costly sofa gazing abstractly at the parting guest horace had dashed off to put on his cocked hat as he was going into the barouche but Francis Minnett was roaming about the hall well prepared for any deed. Well, said Bernard, puffing at his Meersham pipe, I hope you will get on, Alf. I am sure you have that little letter to old Clincham, eh? Indeed I have, said Mr. Saltina. Many thanks for the same, and I do hope Ethel will behave properly. Oh, yes, I expect she will, said Bernard with a sigh. I always do said Ethel in a snappy tone just then there was a great clatter outside and the sound of hoofs and a loud neigh the barouche I take it said Bernard rising slowly quite correct sir said Minnett flinging wide the portals well good-bye Alf old man said Bernard Clark good luck and God bless you he added in a pious tone not at all said Mr. Saltina I have enjoyed my stop which has been short but sweet well good-bye Ethel my child he said as bag in hand he proceeded to the door Francis Minnett bowed low and handed a small parcel to Mr. Saltina a few sandwiches for the journey he remarked oh this is most kind said Mr. Saltina Minnett closed his eyes with a tired smile not kind sir he muttered quite usual Oh, really said mr saltina feeling rather flabbergasted well good-bye my good fellow and he slipped two at six into the butler's open palm mr saltina had to travel first class as active horace ran on to buy the ticket which he presented with a low bow the times and titbits oh many thanks said mr saltina in a most airy voice now will you find me a corner seat in the train eh if there is one sir replied horace in got mr saltina to his first class carriage surrounded by his luggage carefully piled up by a kindly horace the other passengers looked full of envy at the curly white wig and green plush uniform of horace mr saltina crossed his legs in a lordly way and flung a fur rug over his knees though he was hot enough in all conscience he began to feel this was the thin end of the partition and he smiled as he gently tapped the letter in his coat-tail pocket 
when mr saltina arrived in london he began to stroll up the principal streets thinking how gay all was presently he beheld a restaurant with a big menu outside and he went boldly in it was a sumptuous spot all done up in gold with plenty of looking glasses many handsome ladies and gentlemen were already partaking of choice food and rich wines and whiskey and the scene was most lively mr saltina had a little whiskey to make him feel more at home then he ate some curry to the tune of a merry waltz on the band he beat time to the music and smiled kindly at the waiters and he felt very excited inside I am seeing life with a vengeance, he muttered to himself as he paid his bill at the desk. Outside, Mr. Saltina found a tall policeman. Could you direct me to the Crystal Palace, if you please, said Mr. Saltina nervously. Well, said the genial policeman, my advice would be to take a cab, sir. Oh, would it, said Mr. Saltina, then I will do so. He hailed a hansom and got speedily in. To the Crystal Palace, he cried gaily, and, holding his bag on his knees, he prepared to enjoy the sights of the metropolis. It was a merry drive, and all too soon the palace heaved in view. Mr. Saltina sprang out and paid the man, and then he entered the wondrous edifice. His heart beat very fast as two huge men in gold braid flung open the doors. Inside was a lovely fountain in the middle, and all around were little stalls where you could buy sweets and lemonade, also scent handkerchiefs, and many dainty articles. There were a lot of people, but nobody very notable. At last, after buying two bottles of scent and some rather nice sweets, which stuck to his teeth, Mr. Saltina beheld a wooden door on which was nailed a notice, saying, To the private compartments. Aha, said Mr. Saltina to himself, this is evidently my next move. And he gently pushed open the door, straightening his top hat as he did so. Inside he found himself in a dimly lit passage with a thick and handsome carpet. Mr. Saltina gazed round and beheld in the gloom a very superior gentleman in full evening dress, who was reading a newspaper and warming his hands on the hot water pipes. Mr. Saltina advanced on tiptoe and coughed gently, as so far the gentleman had paid no attention. However, at the second cough, he raised his eyes in a weary fashion. Do you want anything? he asked in a most noble voice. Mr. Saltina got very flustered. Well, I am uh, seeking the Earl of Clincham, he began in a trembly voice. Are you by any chance him? he added most respectfully. No, not exactly, replied the other. My name happens to be Edward Procurio. I am half Italian, and I am the groom of the chambers. What chambers? asked Mr. Saltina, blinking his eyes. These, said Edward Procurio, waving a thin arm. Mr. Saltina then noticed several red doors with names of people on each one. Oh, I see, he said. Then perhaps you can tell me where the Earl of Clincham is to be found. At the end of the passage, fourth door down, said Procurio tritely. Of course he may be out. One never knows what they are up to. I suppose not, said Mr. Saltina, in an interested tone. One cannot gamble on anything, really, said Procurio, returning to the hot water pipes though of course I know a lot more than most people about the inmates here. What are the habits of the Earl of Clincham? said Mr. Saltina. Procurio gave a smile. Many and various, he replied. I can't say much in my position, but one lives and learns. He heaved a sigh and shrugged his shoulders. Well, good day, said Mr. Saltina, feeling better for the chat. Procurio nodded in silence as Mr. Saltina trotted off down the passage. At last he came to a door labelled Clincham, Earl of, in big letters. With a beating heart, Mr. Saltina pulled the bell and the door swung open of its own accord. At the same moment a cheery voice rang out from the distance. Come in, please. I am in the study, first door on the left. With a nervous bound, Mr. Saltina obeyed these directions and found himself in a small but handsome compartment 
done in dark green leather with crests on the chairs over the mantelpiece was hung the painting of a lady in a low neck looking quite the thing by the desk was seated a tall man of thirty-five with very nice eyes of a twinkly nature and curly hair he wore quite a plain suit of palest grey but well made and on one of the tables reposed a grey top hat which had evidently been on his head recently he had a rose in his buttonhole also a signet ring hello said this pleasant fellow as mr saltina was spellbound on mat hello your lordship responded our hero bowing low and dropping his hat do i address the earl of clincham you do said the earl with a homely smile and who do i address eh our hero bowed again alfred saltina he said in deep tones oh i see said the kindly earl well come in my man and tell me who you are mr saltina seated himself gingerly on the edge of a crested chair to tell you the truth my lord i am not any one of import and i am not a gentleman as they say he ended getting very red and hot have some whiskey said lord clincham and he poured the liquid into a glass at his elbow mr saltina lapped it up thankfully well my man said the good-natured earl what i say is what does it matter we can't all be of the royal blood can we no said mr saltina but i suppose you are lord clincham waved a careless hand a small portion flows in my veins he said but it does not worry me at all and after all he added piously at the day of judgment what will be the odds mr saltina heaved a sigh i was thinking of this world he said oh i see said the earl but my own idea is that these things are as piffle before the wind not being an earl i can't say answered our hero but may i beg you to read this letter my lord he produced bernard's note from his coat-tails the earl of clincham took it in his long fingers this is what it read my dear clincham the bearer of this letter is an old friend of mine not quite the right side of the blanket as they say in fact he is the son of a first-rate butcher but his mother was a decent family called hyssops of the glen so you see he is not so bad and is desirous of being the correct article could you rub him up a bit in society ways i don't know much details about him but no doubt he will supply all you need i am keeping well and hope you are i must run up to the compartments one day and look you up yours as ever your faithful friend bernard clark the earl gave a slight cough and gazed at mr saltina thoughtfully have you much money he asked and are you prepared to spend a good deal oh yes quite gasped mr saltina i have plenty in the bank and ten pounds in ready gold in my purse you see these compartments are the haunts of the aristocracy said the earl and they are kept going by people who have got something funny in their family and who want to be less mere if you can comprehend indeed i can said mr saltina personally i am a bit partial to mere people said his lordship but the point is that we charge a goodly sum for our training here but however if you can't pay you need not join i can and will proclaimed mr saltina and he placed a ten pound note on the desk his lordship slipped it in his trouser pocket it will be forty-two pounds before i have done with you he said but you can pay me here and there as convenient oh thank you cried mr saltina not at all said the earl and now to business while here you will live in compartments in the basement known as lower range you will get many hints from the groom of the chambers as to clothes and etiquette to menials you will mix with me for grammar and i might take you out hunting or shooting sometimes to give you a few tips also i have lots of ladies parties which you will attend occasionally mr saltina's eyes flashed with excitement i shall enjoy that he cried his lordship coughed loudly you may not marry while under instruction he said firmly oh i shall not need to thank you said mr saltina you must also decide on a profession 
said his lordship as your instruction will vary accordingly could i be anything at buckingham palace said mr salteena with flashing eyes oh well i dont quite know said the noble earl but you might perhaps gallop beside the royal barouche if you care to try oh indeed i should cried mr salteena i am very fond of fresh air and royalties well said the earl with a knowing smile i might arrange it with the prince of wales who i am rather intimate with not really gasped mr salteena dear me yes remarked the earl carelessly and if we decide for you to gallop by the royal vehicle you must be measured for some plush knickerbockers at once mr salteena glanced at his rather fat legs and sighed well i must go out now and call on a few dowagers said his lordship picking up his elegant top hat well au revoir he added with a good french accent adieu my lord cried mr salteena not to be outdone we meet anon i take it not till tomorrow answered the earl you will now proceed to the lower regions where you will no doubt find tea he nodded kindly and glided out in silence here i will end my chapter end of chapter chapter 6 high life mr saltina awoke next morning in his small but pleasant room it was done in green and white with monograms on the toilet set he had a tiny white bed with a green quilt and a picture of the nativity and one of windsor castle on the walls the sun was shining over all these things as mr saltina opened his sleepy eyes just then there was a rat tap on the door come in called mr saltina and in came edward procurio balancing a tray very cleverly he looked most elegant with his shiny black hair and pale yellow face and half-shut eyes he smiled in a very mysterious and superior way as he placed the tray on mr saltina's pointed knees your early beverage he announced and began to pull up the blind still smiling to himself oh thank you cried mr saltina feeling very tousled compared to this grand fellow then to his great surprise procurio began to open the wardrobe and look at mr saltina's suits making italian exclamations under his breath mr saltina dare not say a word so he swallowed his tea and ate a marie biscuit hastily presently procurio advanced to the bed with a bright blue serge suit will you wear this today sir he asked quietly oh certainly said mr saltina and a clean shirt would not come on this said procurio what about this pale blue and white stripe with pleasure replied mr saltina so procurio laid them out in neat array also a razor and brush for shaving then he opened a door saying this is the bathroom shall i turn on hot or cold i don't mind said mr saltina feeling very hot and ignorant it is best for you to decide sir said procurio firmly well i will try cold said mr saltina feeling it was more manly to say that procurio bowed and beat a retreat to the bathroom then he returned and told mr saltina that when he was washed he would find his breakfast in the sitting room when mr saltina was dressed in his best blue suit and clean shirt he strolled into the sitting room where a gay canary was singing fit to burst in the window and a couple of doves cooing in a wicker cage a cheery smell greeted him as percurio glided in with some steaming coffee Mr. Saltina felt more at home and passed a few remarks about the weather. Procurio smiled and uncovered some lovely kidneys on toast, and as he did so, bent and whispered in Mr. Saltina's ear, You should have come in, in your dressing gown. Mr. Saltina gave a start. Oh, can I? he said. Ten thousand thanks! then procurio passed out and mr saltina finished his kidneys and chirruped to the birds and had a cigarette from a handsome purple box which he found on the desk 
Then Procurio entered once more, and, with a bow, said, His lordship is going to a levy this morning, and thinks it might amuse you to go. Could you be ready by eleven o'clock? Oh, yes, what fun, said Mr. Saltina. Have you any notion what a levy is, my man? Procurio gave a superior smile. It is a party given by the Queen to very superior people, but this one is given by the Prince of Wales, as the Queen is not quite her usual self today. It will be at Buckingham Palace, so you will drive with his lordship. Mr. Saltina was fearfully excited. What shall I wear? he gasped. Well, of course, you ought to have black satin knickerbockers and a hat with a white feathers, also garters and a star or two. You surprise me, said Mr. Saltina. I have none of those articles. Well, said Procurio kindly, his lordship will lend you his second best cocked hat, as you are obliged to wear one, and I think with a little thought I might rig you up so as to pass muster. Then they rummaged among Mr. Saltina's things, and Procurio got very intelligent and advised Mr. Saltina to wear his black evening suit and roll up his trousers. He also lent him a pair of white silk stockings, which he fastened tightly around his knees with red rosettes. Then he quickly cut a star in silver paper and pinned it to his chest, and also added a strip of red ribbon across his shirt front. Then Mr. Saltina surveyed himself in the glass. Is it a fancy dress party? he asked. No, they always wear that kind of thing. But wait till you see his lordship. If you are ready, sir, I will conduct you in. Mr. Saltina followed Procurio up countless stairs till they came to the Earl's compartments and tapped on the bedroom door. Come in, cried a merry voice, and in they strode. I have done my best with Mr. Saltina, my lord. I trust he will do. The hat, of course, will make a deal of difference. Mr. Saltina bowed nervously, wishing he had got correct knickerbockers, as his trousers did not feel too firm in spite of the garters. Not half bad, cried the Earl. Try on the hat, Saltina. It is on my bed. Mr. Saltina placed it on his head, and the feathers and gold braid became him very well, but he felt very jealous of the Earl, who looked a sight for the gods. He had proper satin knickerbockers with diamond clasps, and buckled shoes and black silk stockings which showed up his long, fine legs. He had a floppy shirt of softest muslin with real lace collar and cuffs. A sword hung at his side, and a crimson sash was round his waist, and a splendid cocked hat on his head. His blue eyes twinkled as he pulled on a pair of white kid gloves. "'Well, come on, Saltina,' he cried, "'and don't be nervous. I will get you a pair of knickers tomorrow. Will you get a handsome procurio?' Presently the Earl and Mr. Saltina were clattering away to Buckingham Palace. You won't mind if I introduce you as Lord Hyssops, do you? said the Earl, as he lit his pipe. You see you are sort of mixed up with the family, so it won't matter, and will look better. So it would, said Mr. Saltina. What do we do at the levee? Oh, we stroll around and eat ices and champagne and that kind of thing. Sometimes there is a little music. Is there any dancing? asked Mr. Saltina. Well, not always, said the Earl. I am glad of that, said Mr. Saltina. I am not so nimble as I was, and my garters are a trifle tight. Sometimes we talk about the laws and politics, said the Earl, if Her Majesty is in that kind of mood. Just then the splendid edifice appeared in view, and Mr. Saltina licked his dry lips at the sight of the vast crowd. All round were carriages full of costly people, and outside the railings stood tall lifeguards, keeping off the mere people who had gathered to watch the nobility clatter up. Lord Clincham began to bow right and left, raising his cocked hat to his friends. There was a lot of laughter and friendly words as the cab finally drew up at the door. 
two tall lifeguards whisked open the doors and one of them kindly tipped the cabman mr saltina followed his lordship up the grand steps trying to feel as homely as he could then a splendid-looking fellow in a red tunic and a sort of black velvet tam o shanter stepped forward from the throng shouting what name please the earl of clincham and lord hyssops calmly replied the earl gently nudging mr saltina to act up mr saltina nodded and blinked at the menial as much as to say all is well and then he and the earl hung up their cocked hats on two pegs this way cried a deep voice and another menial appeared wearing stiff white breeches top boots and a green velvet coat with a leather belt also a very shiny top hat they followed this fellow down countless corridors and finally came to big folding doors the earl twiddled his mustache and slapped his leg with his white glove as calmly as could be mr saltina perspired rather hard and gave a hitch to his garters to make sure then the portals divided and their names were shouted in chorus by countless domestics the sumptuous room was packed with men of a noble nature dressed like the earl in satin knickerbockers etc and with ladies of every hue with long trains and jewels by the dozens you could hardly move in the gay throng dukes were as naught as there were a good lot of princes and archdukes as it was a very superior levy indeed the earl and mr saltina struggled through the crowd till they came to a platform draped with white velvet here on a golden chair was seated the prince of wales in a lovely ermine cloak and a small but costly crown he was chatting quite genially with some of the crowd up clambered the earl followed at top speed by mr saltina hello clincham cried the prince quite homely and not at all grand so glad you turned up quite a squash eh a bit overpowering your highness said the earl who was quite used to all this may i introduce my friend lord hyssops he is staying with me so i thought i would bring him along if you don't mind prince not at all cried the genial prince looking rather surprised mr saltina bowed so low he nearly fell off the platform and as the prince put out a hand mr saltina thought he had better kiss it the prince smiled kindly i am pleased to see you lord hyssops he said in a regal voice then the earl chipped in and how is the dear queen he said reverently not up to much said his highness she feels the heat poor soul and he waved to a placard which said in large letters the queen is indisposed presently his highness rose i think i will have a quiet glass of champagne he said you come too clincham and bring your friend the diplomats are arriving and i am not much in the mood for deep talk i have already signed a dozen documents so i have done my duty they all went out by a private door and found themselves in a smaller but gorgeous room the prince tapped on the table and instantly two menials in red tunics appeared bring three glasses of champagne commanded the prince and some ices he said majestically the goods appeared as if by magic and the prince drew out a cigar case and passed it round one grows weary of court life he remarked oh yes agreed the earl it upsets me said the prince lapping up his strawberry ice all i want is peace and quiet and a little fun and here i am tied down to this life he said taking off his crown being royal has many painful drawbacks true mused the earl silence fell and the strains of the band could be heard from the next room suddenly the prince gazed at mr saltina who did you say you were he asked in a puzzled tone lord hyssops responded our hero growing purple at the lie well you are not a bit like the lord hyssops i know replied the prince could you explain matters mr saltina gazed helplessly at the earl who had grown very pale 
and seemed lost for the moment. However, he quickly recovered. He is quite all right, really, Prince, he said. His mother was called Miss Hyssops of the Glen. Indeed, said His Royal Highness. That sounds correct. But who was your father, eh? Then Mr. Saltina thought he would not tell a lie, so in trembly tones he muttered, My poor father was uh, but a butcher, your highness, a, a, a very honest one, I may add, and pa a passing rich. Uh, he was called Dominic Saltina, and my name is Alfred Saltina. The prince stroked his yellow beard and rather admired Mr. Saltina for his truthful utterance. Oh, I see, he said. Well, why did you palm off on my menials as Lord Hyssops, eh? Mr. Saltina wiped his sweating brow, but the Earl came to the rescue nobly. My fault entirely, Prince, he chimed in. As I was bringing him to this very superior levy, I thought it would be better to say he was of noble birth. Have I offended your royal dignity? Not much, said the Prince. It was a laudable notion, and perhaps I will ask Mr. Saltina to one of my big balls some day. Oh, your highness, gasped our hero, falling on one knee. That would indeed be a treat. I suppose, Prince, you have not got a job going at this place for my friend, asked the Earl. You see, I am rubbing him up in society ways, and he fancies court life as a profession. Oh, does he? said the prince, blinking his eyes. Well, I might see. I suggested if there was a vacancy going, he might try cantering after the royal barouche, said the earl. So he might, said the prince. I will speak to the prime minister about it and let you know. Ten thousand thanks, cried Mr. Saltina, bowing low. Well, now I must get along back to the levee, announced the prince, putting on his crown. I have booked a waltz with the Archduchess of Greenwich, and this is her favourite tune. So saying, they issued back into the room where the nobility were whirling gaily round. The more serious people, such as the Prime Minister and the Admirals, etc., were eating ices and talking passionately about the laws in a low undertone. The Earl was soon mingling gaily in a set of lancers, but Mr. Saltina dare not because of his trousers. However, he sat on a velvet chair and quite enjoyed overhearing the intelligent conversation of the Prime Minister. And now we will leave our hero enjoying his glimpse of high life and return to Ethel Montague. End of chapter. End of part one. Part two of The Young Visitors or Mr. Saltina's Plan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter seven Bernard's Idea. After Mr. Saltina had departed, Bernard Clark thought he would show Ethel over his house so they spent a merry morning so doing. Ethel passed bright remarks on all the rooms, and Bernard thought she was most pretty, and Ethel began to be a bit excited. After a lovely lunch, they sat in the gloomy hall, and Ethel began to feel very glad Mr. Saltina was not there. Suddenly, Bernard lit his pipe. I was thinking, he said passionately, what about going up to London for a few weeks gaiety? Who? inquired Ethel in a low tone. You and me, said Bernard. I know of several splendid hotels, and we could go to theatres and parties and enjoy ourselves to the full. So we could. What an idea! cried Ethel. So the merry plan was all arranged and they spent the afternoon in packing their trunks. Next day they were all ready in the hall when the handsome vehicle once more clattered up. Ethel had on her blue velvet get-up, 
and a sweet new hat and plenty of rouge on her face, and looked quite a seemly counterpart for Bernard, who was arrayed in a white and shiny mackintosh, top boots, and a well-brushed top hat, tied on to him with a bit of black elastic. "'Well, good-bye, Minute,' he cried to the sombre butler. "'Take care of your gout and the silver, and I will pay your wages when I come back.' "'Thank you kindly, sir,' murmured Minute. "'When may I expect your return?' "'Oh, well, I will wire,' he said, and dashed down the steps. Ethel followed with small ladylike steps, having bowed politely to Minute, who closed his eyes in acknowledgment of her kindness. The sun was shining, and Ethel had the feeling of going to a very jolly party, and felt so sorry for all the passers-by who were not going to London with Bernard. Arrived in the gay city, Bernard hailed a cab to the manor bourne, and got in followed by Ethel. "'Kindly drive us to the Gaiety Hotel,' he cried in a firm tone. The cabman waved his whip, and off they dashed. "'We shall be highly comfortable and select at the Gaiety,' said Bernard, and he thought to himself how lovely it would be if he was married to Ethel. He blushed a deep shade at his own thoughts, and gave a sidelong glance at Ethel, who was gazing out of the window. "'Well, one never knows.' he murmured to himself, and as one of the poets says, great events from trivial causes springs. Just when they stopped at the gay hotel, and Ethel was spellbound at the sight of the big hall, Bernard poked his head into the window of the pay-desk. "'Have you a couple of bedrooms for self and young lady?' he inquired in a lordly way. A very handsome lady with golden hair and a lace apron glanced at a book and hastily replied oh yes sir two beauties on the first floor number nine and ten thank you said bernard we will go up if you have no objection none whatsoever sir said the genial lady the beds are well aired and the view is quite pleasant come along ethel cried bernard this sounds all right eh oh quite said ethel with a beaming smile they went upstairs and entered number nine, a very fine compartment with a large downy bed and white doors with glass handles leading into number ten, an equally dainty room, but a trifle smaller. Which will you have, Ethel? asked Bernard. Oh, well, I would rather you settled it, said Ethel. I am willing to abide by your choice. The best shall be yours, then, said Bernard, bowing gallantly and pointing to the biggest room. Ethel blushed at his speaking look. I shall be quite lost in that huge bed, she added, to hide her embarrassment. Yes, I expect you will, said Bernard. And now what about a little table d'hote, followed by a theatre? Oh, yes, cried Ethel, and downstairs they went. End of chapter. Chapter 8 a gay call. I tell you what, Ethel, said Bernard Clark, about a week later, we might go and pay a call on my pal, the Earl of Clincham. Oh, do let's, cried Ethel, who was game for any new adventure. I would dearly love to meet his lordship. Bernard gave a frown of jealousy at her rather mere words. Well, dress in your best, he muttered. Ethel skipped into her bedroom and arrayed herself in a grass-green muslin of decent cut, a lace scarf, long fawn-colored kid gloves, and a muslin hat to correspond. She carried a parasol in one hand, also a green silk bag containing a few stray hairpins, a clean handkerchief, five shillings, and a pot of rouge in case. She looked a dainty vision, with her fair hair waving in the breeze, and Bernard bit his lips rather hard for he could hardly contain himself, and felt he must marry Ethel soon. He looked a handsome sight himself in some exquisite white trousers, with a silk shirt and a pale blue blazer, belt, and cap. He wore this in honor of the Earl, who had been to Cambridge in his youth, and so had Bernard Clark. At last they found themselves in the entrance hall of the Crystal Palace, and speedily made their way to the private compartments. Edward Procurio was walking up and down the passage, looking dark and mysterious, 
as usual. Is his lordship at home? cried Bernard Clark cheerily. Which one? asked Procurio. Many lords live here, he said scornfully. Well, I mean the Earl of Clincham, said Bernard. Oh, yes, he is in, responded Procurio, and to the best of my belief, giving a party. Indeed, ejaculated Bernard. We have come in the nick of time, Ethel, he added. Yes, said Ethel in an excited tone. Then they pealed on the bell and the door flew open. Sounds of laughter and comic songs issued from the abode, and in a second they were in the crowded drawing room. It was packed with all the elite, and a stout duchess with a good-natured face was singing a lively song and causing much merriment. The earl strode forward at sight of the two newcomers. Hello, Bernard, old boy, he cried. This is a pleasure. And who have you got with you? he added, glancing at Ethel. Oh, this is Miss Montague, said Bernard. Shall I introduce you? If you will be so good, said the earl, in an affable tone, and Bernard hastily performed the rite. Ethel began a bright conversation, while Bernard strolled off to see if he could find any friends amid the throng. What pleasant compartments you have, cried Ethel, in rather a society tone. Fairly so-so, responded the earl. Do you live in London, he added, in a loud tone, as someone was playing a very difficult piece on the piano. Well, no, I don't, said Ethel. My home is really in Northumberland, but I am at present stopping with Mr. Clark at the Gaiety Hotel, she continued in a somewhat showing-off tone. Oh, I see, said the earl. Well, shall I introduce you to a few of my friends? Oh, please do, said Ethel, with a dainty blow at her nose. The earl disappeared into the madding crowd, and presently came back with a middle-aged gentleman. This is Lord Hyssops, he said. My friend, Miss Montague, he added genially. Ethel turned a dull yellow. Lord Hyssops, she said in a faint voice. Why, it is Mr. Saltina. I know him well. Hush, cried the earl. It is a title bestowed recently by my friend, the Prince of Wales. Yes, indeed, murmured Mr. Saltina, deeply flabbergasted by the ready wit of the earl. Oh, indeed, said Ethel in a peevish tone. Well, how do you come to be here? I am stopping with his lordship, said Mr. Saltina, and have a set of compartments in the basement, so there. I don't care, said Huffy Ethel. I am in handsome rooms at the Gaiety. Nothing could be nicer, I am sure, struck in the earl. What do you say, Hyssops, eh? Doubtless it is charming, said Mr. Saltina, who was wanting peace. Tell me, Ethel, how do you leave Bernard? I have not left him, said Ethel, in an annoying voice. I am stopping with him at the Gaiety, and we have been to lots of theatres and dances. Well, I am glad you are enjoying yourself, said Mr. Saltina kindly. You had been looking pale of late. No wonder in your stuffy domain, cried Ethel. Well, have you got any more friends? she added, turning to the earl. Well, I will see, said the obliging earl, and he once more disappeared. I don't know why you should turn against me, Ethel, said Mr. Saltina in a low tone. Ethel patted her hair and looked very sneery. Well, I called it very mysterious. You going off and getting a title, said Ethel and I think our friendship had better stop, as no doubt you will soon be marrying a duchess or something. Not at all, said Mr. Saltina. You must know, Ethel, he said, blushing, a deep red. I always wished to marry you some fine day. This is news to me, cried Ethel, still peevish. But not to me, murmured Mr. Saltina, and his voice trembled in his chest. I may add that I have always loved you, and now I seem to do so madly, he added passionately. But I don't love you, responded Ethel. But if you married me, you might get to, said Mr. Saltina. I think not, replied Ethel. And all the same, it is very kind of you to ask me. And she smiled more nicely at him. This is agony, cried Mr. Saltina clutching hold of a table. My life will be sour grapes and 
ashes without you be a man said Ethel in a gentle whisper and I shall always think of you in a warm manner well half a loaf is better than no bread responded mr. Saltina in a gloomy voice and just then the Earl reappeared with a very brisk lady in a tight silk dress whose name was called Lady Gay Finchling and her husband was a general but he had been dead a few years so this is miss Montague she began in a rather high voice oh yes said Ethel and mr. Saltina wiped the foaming dew from his forehead little did lady gay finchling guess she had just disturbed a proposal of marriage the earl chimed into the conversation now and again and lady gay finchling told several rather witty stories to enliven the party then bernard clark came up and said they had better be going well goodbye clincham he said i must say i have enjoyed this party most rechauffe i call it don't you ethel most cried ethel I suppose you often come, she added in a tone of envy to Lady Gay Finchling. Pretty often, said Lady G. F. Well, good-bye, as I see you are in a hurry to be off, and she dashed off towards the refreshment place. Good-bye, Ethel, said poor Mr. Saltina in a spasm, and he seized hold of her hand. You will one day rue your wicked words. Farewell, he repeated emphatically. Oh! Well, good-bye, said Ethel in a vague tone, and then turning to the Earl, she said, I have enjoyed myself very much, thank you. Please don't mention it, cried the Earl. Well, good-bye, Bernard, he added. I shall look you up some day at your hotel. Yes, do, muttered Bernard. Always welcome, Clincham, old boy, he added, placing his blue cricket cap on his head and so saying he and ethel left the gay scene and once more oozed forth into the streets of london end of chapter chapter 9 a proposal next morning while imbibing his morning tea beneath his pink silken quilt bernard decided he must marry ethel with no more delay i love the girl he said to himself and she must be mine but I somehow feel I cannot propose in London. It would not be seemly in the city of London. We must go for a day in the country, and when surrounded by the gay twitterings of the birds and the smell of the cows, I will lay my suit at her feet. And he waved his arm wildly at the gay thought. Then he sprang from bed and gave a rat tat at Ethel's door. Are you up, my dear? he called. Well, not quite, said Ethel hastily, jumping from her downy nest. Be quick, cried Bernard. I have a plan to spend a day near Windsor Castle, and we will take our lunch and spend a happy day. Oh, hurrah, shouted Ethel. I shall soon be ready, as I had my bath last night, so won't wash very much now. No, don't, said Bernard, and added in a rather fervent tone through the chink of the door. You are fresher than the rose, my dear. No soap could make you fairer. Then he dashed off, very embarrassed, to dress. Ethel blushed and felt a bit excited as she heard the words, and she put on a new white muslin dress in a fit of high spirits. She looked very beautiful with some roses in her hat, and the dainty red rouge on her cheeks looked quite the thing. Bernard heaved a sigh, and his eyes flashed as he beheld her, and Ethel thought to herself, what a fine type of manhood he represented, with his nice thin legs in pale brown trousers, and well-fitting spats, and a red rose in his buttonhole, and rather a sporting cap, which gave him a great air with its quaint check, and little flaps to pull down if necessary. Off they started, the envy of all the waiters. They arrived at Windsor very hot from the journey, and Bernard at once hired a boat to row his beloved up the river. Ethel could not row, but she much enjoyed seeing the tough sunburnt arms of Bernard tugging at the oars as she lay among the rich cushions of the dainty boat. She had a rather lazy nature, but Bernard did not know of this. However, he soon got dog-tired and suggested lunch by the mossy bank. Oh, yes, said Ethel, quickly opening the sparkling champagne. Don't spill any, cried Bernard, as he carved some chicken. 
They eat and drank deeply of the charming viands, ending up with meringues and chocolates. Let us now bask under the spreading trees, said Bernard in a passionate tone. Oh, yes, let's, said Ethel, and she opened her dainty parasol and sank down upon the long green grass. She closed her eyes, but she was far from asleep. Bernard sat beside her in profound silence, gazing at her pink face and long, wavy eyelashes. He puffed at his pipe for some moments while the larks gaily caroled in the blue sky. Then he edged a trifle closer to Ethel's form. Ethel, he murmured in a trembly voice. Oh, what is it? said Ethel, hastily sitting up. Words fail me, ejaculated Bernard hoarsely. My passion for you is intense, he added fervently. It has grown day and night since I first beheld you. Oh, said Ethel in surprise, I am not prepared for this, and she leant back against the trunk of the tree. Bernard placed one arm tightly round her. When will you marry me, Ethel? he uttered. You must be my wife. It has come to that, and I love you so intensely that if you say no, I shall perforce dash my body to the brink of yon muddy river, he panted wildly. Oh, don't do that, implored Ethel, breathing rather hard. Then say you love me, he cried. Oh, Bernard, she sighed fervently, I certainly love you madly. You are to me like a heathen god, she cried, looking at his manly form and handsome flashing face. I will indeed marry you. How soon, gasped Bernard, gazing at her intensely. As soon as possible, said Ethel, gently closing her eyes. My darling, whispered Bernard, and he seized her in his arms. We will be married next week. Oh, Bernard, muttered Ethel, this is so sudden. No, no, cried Bernard and taking the bull by both horns, he kissed her violently on her dainty face. My bride-to-be, he murmured several times. Ethel trembled with joy as she heard the mystic words. Oh, Bernard, she said, little did I ever dream of such as this, and she suddenly fainted into his outstretched arms. Oh, I say, gasped Bernard and laying the dainty burden on the grass, he dashed to the water's edge and got a cup full of the fragrant river to pour on his true love's pallid brow. She soon came to and looked up with a sickly smile. "'Take me back to the Gaiety Hotel,' she whispered faintly. "'With pleasure, my darling,' said Bernard. "'I will just pack up our viands ere I unloose the boat.' Ethel felt better after a few drops of champagne and began to tidy her hair while Bernard packed the remains of the food. Then, arm in arm, they tottered to the boat. "'I trust you have not got an illness, my darling,' murmured Bernard as he helped her in. "'Oh, no, I am very strong,' said Ethel. "'I fainted from joy,' she added to explain matters. "'Oh, I see,' said Bernard, handing her a cushion. "'Well, some people do,' he added kindly and so saying they rode down the dark stream now flowing silently beneath a golden moon all was silent as the lovers glided home with joy in their hearts and radiance on their faces only the sounds of the mysterious water lapping against the frail vessel broke the monotony of the night so i will end my chapter end of chapter chapter ten preparing for the fray. The next few days were indeed busy for Ethel and Bernard. First of all, Ethel got some dainty pink note paper with silver crest on it, and sent out invitations in the following terms to all their friends. Miss Ethel Montague will be married to Mr. Bernard Clark at Westminster Abbey on June 10th. Your company is requested there at 2.30 sharp, and afterwards, for refreshments, at the Gaiety Hotel. RSVP. Having posted heaps of these and got several replies, Ethel began to order her wedding dress, which cost a good bit. 
she chose a rich satin with a humped pattern of gold on the pure white and it had a long train edged with arum lilies her veil was of pure lace with a crown of orange blossom her bouquet she ordered to be of white dog daisies st joseph lilies and orange blossoms tied up with pale blue satin ribbon you will indeed be a charming spectacle my darling gasped bernard as they left the shop then they drove to the tailor where bernard ordered an elegant black suit with coat tails lined with crimson satin and a pale lavender tie and an opera hat of the same hue and he intended to wear violets in his buttonholes also his best white spats diamond studs and a few extras of costly air they both ordered a lot of new clothes besides and bernard gave ethel a very huge tiara made of rubies and diamonds also two rich bracelets and ethel gave him a brand new trunk of shiny green leather the earl of clincham sent a charming gift of some hem stitched sheets edged with real lace and a photo of himself in a striking attitude mr saltina sent ethel a bible and a few pious words of advice and regret and he sent bernard a very handy little camp stool ethel's parents were too poor to come so far but her mother sent a gold watch which did not go but had been some years in the family and her father provided a check for two pounds and promised to send her a darling little baby calf when ready then they ordered the most splendid refreshments they had tea and coffee and sparkling wines to drink also a lovely wedding cake of great height with a sugar angel at the top holding a sword made of almond paste they had countless cakes besides also ices jelly meringues jam tarts with plenty of jam on each some cold tongue some ham with salad and a pig's head done up in a wondrous manner ethel could hardly contain herself as she gazed at the sumptuous repast and bernard gave her a glass of rich wine while he imbibed some whiskey before going to bed ethel got speedily into her bed for the last time at the dear old gaiety and shed a few salt tears thinking of her past life but she quickly cheered up and began to plan about how many children she would have i hope i shall have a good lot she thought to herself and so saying she fell into repose End of chapter. Chapter 11. The Wedding The Abbey was indeed thronged next day when Ethel and Bernard cantered up in a very fine carriage drawn by two prancing steeds who foamed a good deal. In the porch stood several clean altar boys who conducted the lucky pair up the aisle while the organ pealed a merry blast. The mighty edifice was packed and seated in the front row was the earl of clincham looking very brisk as he was going to give ethel away at the correct moment beside him sat mr saltina all in black and looking bitterly sad and he ground his teeth as ethel came marching up there were some merry hymns and as soon as ethel and bernard were one the clergyman began a sermon about adam and eve and the serpent and mr saltina cried into his large handkerchief and the earl kept on nudging him as his sniffs were rather loud then the wedding march pealed forth and down the church stepped ethel and bernard as husband and wife into the cab they got and speedily dashed off to the gaiety the wedding refreshments were indeed a treat to all and even mr saltina cheered up when he beheld the wedding cake and sparkling wines then the earl got up and made a very fine speech about marriage vows and bliss and he quoted several good bits from the bible which got a lot of applause bernard replied in good round terms i thank your lordship for those kind remarks he said in clear tones i expect we shall be as happy as a lark and i hope you will all be ditto some day here here muttered a stray lady in the crowd and down sat bernard while ethel went up to change her wedding garment for a choice pink velvet dress with a golden girdle and a very chic toque 
Bernard also put on a new suit of blue stripe and some silk socks and clean underclothing. Hurrah! Hurrah! shouted the guests as the pair reappeared in the aforesaid get-ups. Then everyone got a bag of rice and sprinkled on the pair, and Mr. Saltina sadly threw a white tennis shoe at them, wiping his eyes all the while. Off drove the happy pair, and the guests finished up the food. The happy pair went to Egypt for their honeymoon, as they thought it would be a nice warm spot, and they had never seen the wondrous land. Ethel was a bit sick on the boat, but Bernard braved the storm in manly style. However, Ethel had recovered by the time they got to Egypt, and here we will leave them for a merry six weeks of bliss while we return to England. End of chapter. Chapter 12. How it ended. Mr. Saltina, by the aid of the Earl and the kindness of the Prince of Wales, managed to get the job his soul craved, and any day might be seen in Hyde Park or Piccadilly galloping madly after the royal carriage in a smart suit of green velvet with knickerbockers complete. At first he was rather terrified, as he was not used to riding, and he found his horse bumped him a good deal, and he had to cling on desperately to its flowing mane. At other times the horse would stop dead, and Mr. Saltina would use his spurs and bad language with no avail. But he soon got more used to his fresh and sultry steed, and his royal highness seemed satisfied. The earl continued his merry life at the compartments till finally he fell in love with one of the noble ladies who haunted them. She was not so pretty as Ethel, as she had a rather bulgy figure and brown eyes, but she had lovely raven tresses, a pointed nose, and a rose-like complexion of a dainty hue. She had very nice feet and plenty of money. Her name was called Lady Helena Herring, and her age was twenty-five and she mated well with the earl. Mr. Saltina grew very lonely after the earl was married, and he could not bear a single life any more. So, failing Ethel, he married one of the maids-in-waiting at Buckingham Palace, by name Bessie Topp, a pleasant girl of eighteen, with a round red face and rather starry eyes. So now that all our friends are married, I will add a few words about their families. Ethel and Bernard returned from their honeymoon with a son and heir, a nice fat baby called Ignatius Bernard. They soon had six more children, four boys and three girls, and some of them were twins, which was very exciting. The Earl only got two rather sickly girls called Helen and Marie, because the last one looked slightly French. Mr. Saltina had a large family of ten, five of each but he grew very morose as the years rolled by, and his little cottage was very noisy, and his wife was a bit annoying at times, especially when he took to dreaming of Ethel and wishing he could have married her. Still, he was a pious man in his way, and found relief in prayer. Bernard Clark was the happiest of our friends, as he loved Ethel to the bitter end, and so did she him, and they had a nice house, too. The Earl soon got tired of his sickly daughters, and his wife had a savage temper, so he thought he would divorce her and try again, but he gave up the idea after several attempts, and decided to offer it up as a mortification. So now, my dear readers, we will say farewell to the characters in this book. The End End of The Young Visitors, or Mr. Saltina's Plan, by Daisy Ashford age nine.